Good evening. This is Annabelle talking to you again about Brexit. Do you know, I had a dream last night that one day I will be able to say to you, this is our final Brexit webinar. And I'm very sorry, today is not that final webinar, because as you are doubtless aware, we're still not entirely sure what's going on with Brexit. So thank you for your patience in joining me this evening. We are getting closer and closer to a deadline that no one has moved and a deal that no one has made. So tonight is really about what are our priorities? What do we need to sort out as a community and as a group to make sure that our businesses survive and thrive come what may? And um, I'm going to start on the first subject, um, which is relatively simple from my point of view. So the, su the subject that's front running at the moment is GDPR. So we're not going to spend hours on that because we've got separate GDPR updates. But in a nutshell, whether we're in the EU or not, we are still bound by the same GDPR rules just like the Americans are and anyone else in the world because the EU claims something called extraterritoriality great word isn't it which means that they say their rules apply even if you are not physically located inside the eu when it comes to handling data about european citizens it's pretty similar to the situation in the, that applies i don't know if you're aware of this but american citizens have to pay american taxes wherever they live in the world it doesn't matter that they're not in the usa that's what extraterritoriality means so if you have got data about EU citizens on your mailing list, on your customer list, on your databases, then GDPR is going to continue to apply to them in exactly the same way it does today, whether we have a hard Brexit or a soft Brexit. The first thing we need to do is to know, therefore, whether you've actually got people in your database um, that are based in the EU. Now, you can Google lists of EU domains. There's obviously .eu, but there's also .ie, .whatever, .de, all the European domains. And the first thing you need to do is have a very quick look through your own mailing lists and databases for addresses. If you're doing business in the EU, there's no reason why you shouldn't continue to market to the EU. The great thing about the internet particularly is we can go global from our back bedroom, can't we? And many of us have done it. The main difference is this. The EU is, has a list of approved countries to which European citizens' data can be sent. If we hard Brexit for a period of time, and an unknown period of time, we will not be on that list because we can't apply to be put on that list until we've come out. So for a period of time, it could be weeks, it could be months, we will not be on the list. That doesn't mean we can't lawfully process data about EU citizens. It means we have to do it a different way. And the way we do it is by contracting to follow those rules and have appropriate levels of security. If you are already a Coffee Clutch customer and you use Coffee Clutch terms of business or Coffee Clutch um, hiring of associate agreements, are, we are going away next week to sit with a wet towel around our head and put the relevant clauses into your contracts. If you are within your support period, and that will be six months, a year or 18 months from when you bought, depending what level you bought at, those will be dropped into your document folders at no additional charge. We did that for you on GDPR. We're going to do it again on IR35. Um, go mad, IR35 is the next one we've got to do with on Brexit. We don't see this as an opportunity to kind of make a quick buck in a rather nervous market. So we are definitely sorting that out for you if you already have our standard terms and you don't need to worry about that but that's next week's mission that is already in hand it'll take a couple of weeks for them to appear in your folder but we've worked out what we're doing 
Now, what we're doing is on a kind of three-way bet, because if you're in business, you have to assess risks and you have to assess what are the opportunities and probabilities. Now, the truth is, I don't know anyone who could tell me, other than as a matter of opinion, whether we will Brexit at all on the 29th of March, whether we will go out with Theresa May's deal, whether we will hold Brexit, whether we will go out on some other date, or indeed whether we won't go at all. And anybody who tells you they're absolutely certain is just giving you an opinion. And in the end, by the time we know what someone's opinion is, it'll be too late to act on it because all businesses, however small, need a plan. So the plan we want to formulate with you is that you do the work to, on the basis of a hard Brexit. Why? Because the deal Brexit doesn't really mention or deal with GDPR anyway. The only thing that means we have no work to do about GDPR is if we stay in. Or I suppose if we get an extension, we've got more time to do the work, but that seems to be another possibility floating about. Why have we gone with go with the whole Brexit option? Well, because we live in a global economy. I'm actually sitting in London tonight, but in May, I shall be off in Thailand and Cambodia, and I've no doubt I will pick up my email and do a little bit of work there, despite the fact I'm sure it will really irritate my husband. Entrepreneurs do stuff like that. When I am there, regardless of whether the UK remains in the EU or leaves the EU, regardless of whether we have a hard Brexit or a soft Brexit, I will be in a country which is not recognised by the EU as having appropriate data standards. And that means I have to have the right contracts in place to process my client data and my support data in those circumstances. So from my point of view, we are all global, and I'm sure a lot of you here will agree with me that we could trade from our back bedroom. I did a webinar in California a couple of weeks ago. I did one in Israel. That was really strange. I did a lot of work in India and a staggering amount of work in London in Southwark. All from my back bedroom, never mind the going out and doing stuff. So if you take the point of view that many of us are global anyway, the sensible thing to do is to set yourself up so that you are global. That way, you're not wasting your time having to do a kind of UK version, um, an EU in version, a deal, no deal, Norway plus, Canada plus, whatever. That's how we've decided to go with sorting out your contracts because the extra page, frankly, um, is hardly going to make a lot of difference. And that allows you to wander about the world doing your thing. Um, so if you are already GDPR compliant and you've been through the whole process in the UK, the big deal for you is updating your contracts with the necessary extra paragraphs. In terms of processing and security, nothing has changed. I don't want to depress you, but the EU itself is going to make changes to contractual causes and possibly privacy at some point in 2019. But for the next three to six months, nothing is changing other than that. So I hope that sets your mind at rest. The next issue that a lot of concern has been expressed about is travel, both business and personal. And I know we have a number of VAs in our customer group who, whether or not they're traveling, are trying to organize and do the administration on travel for other people. And there's a lot of order, counter order, disorder, opinions and rumors going on. So this is where we are and this is where we could be. Where we are is we have no arrangements. That means if we go with a hard Brexit and we don't do the proper arrangements, we will need visas to travel in Europe on the 30th of March. Almost all of the EU have offered us the opportunity that if we allow their citizens to travel visa free for three months, seems to be the common period, we can do the same in the EU. That's an offer. The deal has not yet been done. 
That is being done independently of whether we're having a hard Brexit or a soft Brexit. It seems to have taken on a life of its own. So that seems to be a real possibility. And I can't really see an extended period of short term visas being required to go into the EU. But if you absolutely have to travel for business or pleasure during April, you need to keep a very close eye on this because at the moment you can travel in the EU if your passport's due to expire the week after you get back. The minute with Brexit, you need to have a period of overrun on your passport, just as you do if you want a visa for America, just as you do if you want a visa for South Africa or Indonesia. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to need a visa, but if your passport is about to run out, you need to consider renewing it because it does take a couple of weeks to get one and you don't want to be discovering that you've only got a month left on your passport a week before you're due to go. And we are now within a few weeks ago. So have a look and make sure anyone who's due to travel has got a passport that runs on a few months before from the, the, the data return. What's not on offer at the moment is longer visas than that. That is the equivalent of what is known as a Schengen visa, which is a visa that allows people who are not in the EU to travel throughout the EU for a three month period. If you need to spend a longer period in the EU than three months, you're going to need to apply for a visa at the appropriate embassy of the country that you're going to be in. To do that, you're going to have to show that you are carrying adequate health insurance. So what that means is you can't rely on the EH1C, which used to be an E111 form, in the hope of getting emergency medical care. Again, that is something that's been debated where some EU countries are saying we will give you emergency cover if you do the same for our citizens. But the deal has not been done. And the problem that we are increasingly facing is that we can't get all this through Parliament. If somebody woke up tomorrow and said, yes, we couldn't have it all done by the 29th of March. Now, whether we could get an extension if we'd agreed to do it but hadn't done it is a separate question to whether we could get an extension if we haven't agreed what we're doing and we don't know what we're doing. Don't get me started on the process for Brexit. We don't have all night. So in any of them, it's an extremely daft idea to travel abroad with nothing but emergency medical cover because although that might cover putting your leg in plaster if you broke it, it will not cover what's known as repatriation getting you home and if you have a heart attack in Tenerife it can set you back 10 grand 20 grand just to be flown back under the right medical conditions so now is a very good time to make sure that you have got appropriate cover even if you were in the habit of not uh, taking it up before driving licenses and cars there is not currently a reciprocal arrangement to recognise British driving licences in the EU. That's not to say that there won't be one, but if you're about to drive in the EU in April, it's probably about time to start thinking about getting yourself an international driving permit. They cost something like twelve ninety five, and it's probably worthwhile toddling off to the relevant post office and getting one rather than discovering when you're on the ferry or going to hire a car in Europe that you can't do. If you're going later than April, you can probably wait and see how it all turns out. There is a list, if you're in our customer groups, hit the Brexit tag of post offices that will issue the new style international driver's permits. It's a bit complicated because you need slightly different one for Spain than you do if you're going to some other elements of the EU. So be absolutely sure you know where you're driving and make sure you get the right bits on the permit. I shall be toddling off to get mine in March. I'm going to get the widest possible range of countries anyway because I just can't be doing with discovering that I've got lost. I'm extraordinarily and famously bad at geography when driving and that I've gone into a country that I'm not covered in. As this thing stands today, 
as members of the EU, your vehicle insurance, if you're taking your own car, is automatically valid in Europe. But the day we Brexit, you are going to have to show some proof that you are insured. And this is what used to be known as a green card. So you have to get hold of your vehicle insurer if you're taking your own car and ask them for one. They seem to be gearing up to do this. But again, if you have got an insurer you normally deal with by post, it could take a while to get one. They're not used to it. Don't leave it till the last minute. Make sure when you get your green card that you're not just covering yourself for third party fire and theft, but also to replace your vehicle if it's stolen, because you don't want to find yourself stranded in Europe with not enough insurance to replace your vehicle or get you home. A lot of us older people remember green cards and that was what they were known as. So if you start hearing people talking about green cards, that's what they are. They are nothing to do with whether your driving license is valid. So you will need a driving license if you want to hire a vehicle abroad and a driving license plus a green card if you're taking a vehicle abroad, plus all the normal things you need for France if you're driving through France. And if you've done it before, you know what I mean. There's a little French driving kit that you need to take. So I hope that answers your questions on that. I'm hoping that for short term holiday travel, this will settle down fairly rapidly come what may. But if you're about to head off in April, it's probably a good idea to take precautions and make sure that you're always lined up as you can be for hard Brexit, even if you're slightly wasting your time at the end of the day. Be careful, though, about wandering in and out of the EU. I've just been um, realising that if you run out of your 90 day Schengen visa, you can't just pop to a non EU country for the day and then come back in again. For business travel, it's far less clear because holiday travel is one thing. But the whole point of Brexit, from the point of view of people who wanted it, was to stop people from other countries coming to the uh, UK to work without us being able to say yes or no to them on an individual basis. So if we remain in that position, the same thing is going to happen to British nationals who want to work abroad. So for trainers and consultants who are working as solopreneurs across Europe, this has already resulted in an awful lot of bookings being just penciled in because nobody knows if you're going to need a work permit or if so, how to apply for one. If Europe mirrors the rules that we've got in place, the rules are very much going to favour highly skilled workers looking for a job and highly paid workers. And it's not at all clear what the situation is going to be about the self-employed. Except that if you want to come to the UK as a self-employed worker, you have some very stiff administrative hurdles to get through now. So if you need to work in Europe in the next 90 days, you're going to have to start looking at alternatives. I'm not saying you won't be able to, but most of the speakers and trainers I know are making sure we can deliver on webinar, make sure we can deliver virtually in case we end up in a situation where we cannot legally go and do our work. I'm not saying we can't, but I cannot say that we can. And as business people, we have to plan the next quarter. So if you absolutely have to go, you need to start talking to the relevant trade attaches in the relevant countries to find out what their idea on the ground is of what's going on. Traditionally, and I remember the days pre um, the EU, it was quite easy to go abroad as a sales rep or someone who wanted to do trade deals. It was always much more difficult to go abroad if you wanted to do plumbing in Germany or you wanted to be uh, something. There had to be a skill shortage and there had to be a reason why you particularly had to be given a visa. So if you are in the service sector, it's quite distinct from manufacturing. And one of the interesting things about the Brexit process we're going through is a lot of the political argument and concern is very understandably about the movement of goods. 
but 80% of the revenue in our economy comes from the sale of services. And the majority of our clients are in the service sector. And we are looking to find ways to contract across Europe to make sure you can handle data and make sure that you can get paid. Because as long as we're in the EU, if somebody in France owes you money, you can raise a, a writ in France or England and get it enforced where they are. After we Brexit, we have to rely on the mutual agreement to enforce contracts. And like so many other things, this will take time. So whatever the outcome of Brexit might be, whatever you might think about the merits of it, we need to make a sort of 30 day to 90 day plan to make sure that you've got everything you need. On the opportunistic side for VAs, the government is subsidising courses at the moment on how to complete customs and excise paperwork. Rather you than me, I'd rather read EU directives in four different languages than try and complete those forms. But there is an opportunity for those of you who are admin minded to get an extra set of skill sets that are going to be sorely needed. I was quite shocked. We have gone through and redone some elements of our GDPR order and discovered a surprising number of people from EU countries on our mailing list who have never really paid much attention to it before because it didn't really matter where they were. And I'm happy to say we have a number of uh, clients in both Spain and France, a few in the Netherlands and a couple in Switzerland. So we are going to have to accommodate ourselves. What is your biggest concern about providing service then? Do you do it virtually? Or do you do it in the room? Um, I know for us, it's made us look at, um, I mean, as you know, I do a lot of speaking, possibly changing our business model for European speaking. I only do a couple of European conferences a year and certainly putting most of those on the back burner for 2019 while it all gets sorted out. So anything I'm being invited to do in Europe, this side of October, I'm just offering to do virtually because I can't be um, doing with getting so many things organised at once while I'm updating everybody's contracts. So the short term plan now is to get everybody's contracts sorted out so you've got viable GDPR enforceable contracts across Europe to get the people who need to travel for fun sorted out by their VAs and to keep a really, really close eye on what's happening for needing to travel for business. I can't imagine even in a world of slightly harder borders than we're used to, a permanent lockdown. But yes, um, virtual is going to be an option. Hiring some locals is going to be an option. With all the interesting uh, supervisory challenges that that brings, actually. I mean, sometimes it can be marvellous to have local trainers and consultants because they are part of the local culture where you're working. Other times it can um, introduce a, a layer of kind of non-standardness about how you deliver in the wrong areas. So it's really quite hard, in my experience, to get the core bit that has to be standard really locked down with local trainers but still have that kind of local colour which makes everybody feel right at home. But then they already do that in markets such as the Emirates and um, Asia. So they're really just taking what they do over there and bringing it back into Europe, which is quite different, I guess, from um, trying to create something that you've never created before. And of course, I suppose there, are room, there is room for collaboration because there must be European-based training and consulting organisations who normally deliver in the UK, who perhaps are up for reciprocal agreements when they can't send people here. But it, it does seem a bit complicated when the traditions of consulting and training are to send the person that the client really wants with the knowledge that they really want. Um, and it's going to be fun. Now, I'm sorry I can't tell you tonight that I know what the government's decided. I have been watching Brexit for so long now. I'm beginning to feel that I may never do my last ever Brexit broadcast. But we do know what the short term needs are, at least in the service sector. So we're all responding in a variety of ways. But out of curiosity, 
how are you feeling about Brexit? I don't know about anyone else, but I'm somewhere between super worried, not about Brexit itself, but about the fact it doesn't seem to be very organised. I'm always excited by change because I'm a natural change bunny and I like it. But I'm also kind of slightly bored by the fact that it's just gone on for such a long time. But I'd rather Persic went on a little bit longer and we got it properly sorted out. So for those of you excited, make your plans carefully because this is going to be a bit of an admin journey, shall we say. And if you're a bit worried, stay close because as soon as anybody knows what needs to be done to make it easier, we will prioritise making sure you know. So focus on being able to travel, focus on being able to contract and do business and hopefully the government and the various people that everyone's negotiating with are going to take care of the rest of it, if not by the 29th of March, then in fairly swift order after that. So keep close to us, let us know what bothers you, come back into the groups and tell us your challenges. Don't forget to check out if you've got EU nationals on your databases. Don't forget to check out your domains. You really will find yourself unable to renew .eu domains. So I hope you've got spare ones with .uk or .com addresses to keep you going. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. I know this is a slightly dry subject, but we have to keep going till we're all organised. It's the way it's going to work. And I just hope somebody somewhere soon manages to negotiate something that somebody somewhere soon can vote on happily. And with that rather over optimistic thought, I will, if you've got nothing else you want to chat about tonight, wish you good evening. Don't worry, it's nearly gin o'clock. I will be back. And the one thing we're not going to do is run out of either rubber ducks or gin. And if you know me, you know there's a reason for that. I'm off to spend a whole week writing contracts and material to support you. If anything comes to mind that bothers you in the meantime, raise it in our groups using the Brexit topic and you will get a response. It might be nobody knows, but if anybody knows, you will. Speak to you soon. Our next webinar on Brexit's in March. Let's hope we've got all the answers by then. Take care. Thanks for joining me.